my task this morning is to share with you uh, the experience of COSEXA, which stands for the College of Surgeons, COS is College of Surgeons in the East, Central, and Southern Africa. Some people refer to Central as Middle, but that's not true. And it's not South Africa, it's Southern Africa. Uh, I am the Secretary General, as I mentioned, of COSEXA. And of late, just to uh, inform you well, we've now formed a College of Health Sciences. EXA, East Central Southern Africa, has a College of Health Sciences. This was formed in June this year. And because surgeons can't work alone, we have a College of Anesthesia with us. It's writing its constitution now. We have a College of Pathologists, which plans to do the first examinations at the end of 2015, if things go well. We have a College of Medicine that was inaugurated in uh, six weeks ago uh, with the help of the Royal College of Surgeons of London. We have a College of Nursing that is there for a long time. That's the oldest college before COSEXA. COSEXA was the first one that started training surgeons in this region. And uh, we have a College of Public Health. So what we are looking at at the present moment in the long run is there are going to be various colleges which will come under the umbrella of EXA College of Health Sciences and I humbly say that I was elected as the chair of the Senate of that college. What's the mission of COSEXA? The mission of COSEXA is to promote access to and excellence in surgical care, training, and research in the East Central and Southern African region. The East Central and Southern African region, basically things started in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. It was the Association of Surgeons of East Africa, as was mentioned earlier. Now we have 10 countries which are member states of COSEXA, we have Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, then Ethiopia and Mozambique joined us. Rwanda joined us about three years ago. Burundi has joined us and we plan to take the first graduates from Burundi in about a year's time. So it's 10 countries working together. How does the college operate? It's a college without walls. It works through the country chapters. Each surgical society in the country is the face of Cossacks in that country. Therefore, the country chapters are the surgical societies. The two country representatives on council are members of the surgical society who come and work with us on the council. As I mentioned, it's a college without walls. We use national resources to train. There are established training institutions like the universities, which are in the metropolitan cities. We have healthcare delivery institutions. This is what we are focusing on, the provincial and the district hospitals in the various countries where training should occur. I'll mention to you why we are, our emphasis there. We use the various surgeons practicing there. These are employed by the government and employed educators to deliver the training. We establish rapport with them. We provide them with the curriculum and the systems of training. The trainees are the employees engaged by the health delivery systems. So these are the doctors working in the district and provincial hospitals who are doctors and interested in surgery. So the whole country becomes a training ground. Students do not, to be, do not need to be relocated to the metropolitan areas in order to train in surgery. Now that's the sine qua non for COSEXA. We have other countries which are satellite countries. They can't be members because they're outside of the region, but they're satellite countries. We're training students in Niger, around there, Cameroon, which is there, Gabon, which is there, and Lesotho, which is in South Africa. So these are satellite countries represented by a COSEXA country and training is going on there. We have countries likely to join. Edna has mentioned that we're going to visit Somaliland in January, hopefully, accredit that hospital, provide a training program, provide a structure for training, and I'll tell you how you can help provide that structure. We're looking at Sudan, which has applied, Southern Sudan, Swaziland, Botswana, and DRC. These are the countries likely to be members of COSEX in the next two years when I'm invited to Amsterdam. Why did COSEX start all this business of training surgeons? Well, if you look at Kenya, that's the best place country in the region. It has a population of approximately 40 million. These are ballpark figures so you can understand carefully and easily. By WHO statistics, if there was a surgeon required for 20,000 people, we would need 2,000 surgeons for the population of 40 million. What do we have? We have 520 surgeons, which makes approximately 25% of the number of surgeons required to treat the Kenyan population. If you look at Malawi, it is 5% of the number of surgeons. If you look at Uganda, 7.5. Tanzania, 7.5. Zambia, 
This is primarily because of COSEXA, that we have 15% of the surgeons and the other countries are represented there. Majority have less than 10% of the number of surgeons required to treat the patients. To add fuel to fire, we were told yesterday, 90% of the Tanzanian surgeons are located in Dar es Salaam and Mwanza. They serve 10% of the population. So 90% of the population in the rest of Tanzania has only 10% of the surgeons looking after them. Ballpark figures again, 85% of the surgeons in, the, in our region serve 15% of the urban population. This is the metropolitan areas. The main aim of COSEXA is to train surgeons in the periphery, in the non-metropolitan areas, so they will stay there and they will work there. What are our achievements? In view of time, I'm going to skip a few slides, but our achievements at the present moment, we, have, we were started by CBM, Christian Blendal Mission, with initial funding. This was our council uh, two years ago, and we have strong links with the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland at the present moment through Irish aid, which provides financial support, courses, e-learning programs, and a lot of other things. We have the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. Now, this is the thrust of my lecture today. What is our role, and how can we improve surgery in that region? The Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons runs hospitals in six countries and trains surgeons there. We facilitate together how to train surgeons. There are partnerships between hospitals in the US and in Africa, all right? They run various hospitals and they train surgeons together with us, and that's what we found is going to be the most successful model. Initially, the ship doctors came, then the missionary doctors came, then the medical school started, then the postgraduate program started. But let me tell you honestly, the governments do not have health as a priority. The economic situation cannot solve this problem, the economic situation in Africa. So we have to see how we sort this problem out, and this is one of the ways that we feel may be the way forwards. We have the Oxford Cool project. This is the COSEXA or Oxford Orthopedic Link project, which runs cure hospitals for pediatric orthopedic surgery in about eight countries. Uh, the ASGBI, Bob Lane is the head of that, and he runs various courses in Africa. We have the Office of International Surgery in Toronto. This is e-learning program through Surgery in Africa. Surgery in Africa is very different from surgery in the West. So we got to train and teach according to what is required on ground. And we have 20 other organizations which are helping us in various ways. We are evaluating what is the best cost-effective method of training surgeons. So just to give you this example, the relationship with Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. This is a missionary organization in the States. It provides funding. It provides surgeons who come down. You form affiliations with, between a hospital in the States and a hospital in uh, Kenya, for example. They're in Cameroon, Bingo Hospital, Gabon, Bongolo Hospital, Ethiopia, Niger, Kenya, Tanzania. They've just taken over a new hospital in Malawi recently, which was accredited about two weeks ago, and that will become a training center for uh, COSEXA. All these are accredited for MCS training. This is the membership of the College of Surgeons, which is two years training after you registered in your country. What are our achievements? This is a college without walls, which I mentioned. The training of surgeons and organizing examinations occurs all over and it's been going on for the last 11 years. We've had over 500 training courses in all and these include, I'll start from here, leadership, management, ethics and professionalism for the Council of COSEXA. We started with courses for the council members which are the trainers of COSEXA. We've added 70 train the trainers courses. These are ongoing. If you go to the COSEXA website, you'll find the whole uh, thing for 2015 listed there. We've had 290 plus basic surgical skills, basic surgical sciences, trauma, critical care, courses for membership candidates. We are running endoscopy and laparoscopy courses, but this is where we, we find we are, we are a bit deficient. We've had 250 candidates so far take the examinations. We've graduated 147 members of the college. These are now working as surgical registrars, mainly in the non-metropolitan areas in the region. And we have 102 consultants in five specialities. This is what we have graduated. If you look at the graph here, in 2003, when we did the first examination, and I wish to appreciate Mike Cotton, who's here. He was leading the MCS when I was leading the general surgery component. And together, we held the first exams in Uganda. We had four candidates. 
In 2014, in Dar es Salaam, in December, the first and second, we're going to be examining 42 MCS candidates and 40 FCS candidates. If all of them pass, that means you'll have 42 junior surgeons or registrars, senior registrars, uh, junior registrars, and 40 consultants coming out of the college. So far, we have 263 current trainees training in these 10 countries. We have 102 graduates, as I alluded earlier. We have 118 accredited trainers. These guys have gone through training courses of how to train in surgery, and they are on ground training. We've got 34 active training sites. We've got 70 accredited hospitals. So if somebody wants to partner with the hospital, this is the way we see forwards. Then contact me, and we can work on this and uh, move ahead. This is the graph. As you see it, four candidates in 2003. This is the membership, and that is where we are today. And that is for the fellowship candidates. We started in 2004, and these are the specialities in which we offer uh, fellowships. General surgery, orthopedic, urology, plastic, neuro, pediatrics, and I believe the cardiothoracic boys are giving their curriculum in December for approval. So what are our graduates currently doing? We've graduated members of the college who perform on an average of 260 operations per year covering basic and emergency surgeries. Our thrust is surgeons should do surgery. That's the college motto, all right? We, I'll show you what, what we're involved in as well. But we feel surgeons should do surgeries, and we look at the logbooks, we look at the numbers done, we look at the results, and then we allow candidates to sit the examinations. So if these guys have 260 operations in their logbooks, Fellows perform the most other surgical procedures in the much needed rural locations. So if you look at this, over the next three years, we're expecting to graduate another 100. It'll be 120. That's the figures we're looking at now. We're estimated it to be 100. Surgeons will perform 26,500 operation surgeries yearly. And if we graduate these 100, this will bring a total of 50,000 surgeries performed in the region from next year. This is what we are hoping, or in the next three years. Uh, our structures, we have a sound administrative and management structure in place. We have a uh, CEO in, in the office in Arusha. We have one administrative assistant. We're supposed to employ three support staff by the year's end, but that's been delayed. And I think by March next year, we'll have one person looking after examinations, one person looking after education, and one person looking after the finance and general purpose, supporting the three committees. So we'll have three more staff in there. We have trans a transparent accounting and auditing system of finances. We've opened bank accounts in each country separately for COSEX accounting systems because there were confusions with government's accounts and all that. Uh, what are the lessons learned? Public sector training will never meet the numbers required. I've been in public sector. I'm a professor with the Department of Surgery at the University of Nairobi. I look after the University of Nairobi surgical trainees as well as sector trainees. But through University of Nairobi, we are never going to meet the numbers that we require. The governments are not having health as their priority in this region. I'll be very honest with you, OK? Uh, no, there are no private, practice sec uh, private sector postgraduate training programs in this region. Uh, Graduate training programs, medical schools. We have lots of medical schools coming up on a private basis at the present moment. We have champions present at the present moment, and these champions care. That is how the college has been born and it's functioning. The COSEXA model is workable to fill the gap that I alluded to. The challenges that we have, we have a finite number of champions who will burn out soon if they don't get support. We need to expand, as I said, we need to double our numbers. And we need improved government hospitals that are required for training. I mentioned government hospitals. These are government or mission or whatever hospitals you call them. The cultural uh, organizations running hospitals. The government is not interested in improving these hospitals. And what is needed in the next decade, this is what we are looking at through our strategic plan. We need to expand the capabilities of general doctors and surgical technicians to offer basic surgery. COSEXA does agree to training clinical officers for surgical training till the need is fulfilled, all right? We have an MCS training program, as I alluded to this, the membership program, which uh, trains surgeons to do basic and emergency surgeries. We have the Zimbabwe extended surgical training program because we are having problems in Zimbabwe, but our main thrust is training surgeons. Make training more practical and competency-based. That's what we're looking at. 
And we want to increase the numbers and realign the capabilities of surgical specialists to leapfrog technology. We're trying to think. We've got a think tank which is looking at how to use this technology so that we don't go through the old model of training surgeons in 10 years, 9 years before we can operate comfortably. So establish centers of excellence through that. Emphasize endoscopic and minimum invasive surgery. This is going to be surgery for the future. This is what I do. And we have to work. And setting up more skills lab to achieve that. Okay? How can you be part of the change? This is my request to all of you. Uh, this is the last slide, I think. Uh, skills lab establishments, creating centers of excellence, visiting faculty, assist with running surgical departments and hospitals. This is the main thing. If you form partnership with hospitals, all right, you have a lot of stuff in this part of the world, all right, which you don't use, which could be helpful to that hospital, but on an individual basis, partnerships don't work, all right? Establish partnerships with the hospitals and make that hospital function where training can go on. For examinations, financial support is welcome. External examiners, examination materials, and research. All right, these are my contacts. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much indeed, Pankaj. Um, there's no excuse now for anybody in this room not understanding Kazexa and all its manifestations. And I'm just going to talk about one tiny little bit because what uh, I do in representing the Association of Surgeons oh, okay. is to design and run courses, training courses, surgical training courses. Um, and this is uh, uh, important just to explain who we are. That's Gazexa, that's ASGBI, IFSC who, sp who helped to uh, sponsor this, UK Aid and the World Health Organization the UK aid are the guys who give me money. I'll come back to them in a minute because all this is uh, tendered grant work. Um, you all know these details here. I'm not going to read them through. This is the background. And we simply ask you one, sim one question. Patients are still suffering and dying unnecessarily simply due to a lack of adequately trained surgical personnel. And I use those words, surgical personnel, advisedly. Now, skills courses are useful because you can train a large number of people at the same time and to the same standard, irrespective of their previous level of training or experience. Okay, that is a very positive and practical advantage. Now, what I want to talk about today is a course that we designed three years ago and uh, Fanna Stryer, who is in the audience, uh, was a, uh, a very uh, important uh, designer as far as critical care was concerned. And basically, it's a five-day course, but we start with train the trainers. All the courses we run have to be sustainable. We don't, there's no point in just coming out, running a course, and then going home again. And I'll explain why in a second. So we always start with a train the trainers. And this train the trainers bit is allied to the course. We don't teach them about uh, ward rounds and this sort of thing. So it's a one day up front of the course itself, which is five days. And this is what the program is. Team working and leadership are absolutely vital. Absolutely vital. Unless you've got people who are keen to uh, become trainers who've had an experience of teaching uh, and who are going to be committed to going on uh, being trainers, then they're not worth having on board. And I'm pleased to say that one or two actually are here in the audience um, and we've been very lucky in the calibre of trainers. So that's the start, the art of lecturing. The assessment process is probably the most important aspect of all because I've said to you that the people giving me the money a lot of money, uh, are the British government. And they don't care where I go, what I do, when I do it, how I do it. All they're interested in is outcomes. They want to know how I've spent the money, has it been value for money? And so we have to have quite a robust assessment system uh, to show, and we have to do this every six months, that we are spending the taxpayers' money appropriately. Each uh, module lead, and there are five uh, modules all together, which you can see here. Uh, critical care, general surgery, orthopedics, trauma, urology, obs and gynae. 
Each lead will just talk about their module, explain what it's about. Role play and critiquing is something which is not done very much in Africa, uh, but it is becoming a little bit more popular now. Um, and to see Fanestrier dressed up uh, in, a, in a, a skirt with a wig on and lipstick, pretending to be uh, a female trainee who's failed the course and being told by uh, one of the trainers uh, why and being counselled is just one example which is worth repeating. Safe surgery, non-technical skills, WHO, always include that and feedback. Now, the, the actual course itself, as I've said, is five modules, one over five days. And at the same time, in parallel, there is a theatre nurse training course. To my mind, there's no point in teaching guys to practice good surgery if in the theatre the nurses are hopeless and have no idea what instruments, what sutures, what the operation's all about. So we run in parallel a theatre nurse training course, just as important as training the surgeons. Now this course, I have to explain again, it was designed for Africa in Africa. We didn't just simply lift up a course in the UK, fly it over and dump it down and say, there you are, get on with it. That's not what you do. You design a course where it's going to take place. All these courses have taken place within the Caseca region so far. That's what the partnership that we have is all about. The um, maximum participants, 18, um, we divide them up into groups of six each. Um, ideally, should have attended a basic surgical skills course and should be first or second year residents or that sort of thing. Medical officers, NPCs, absolutely. This isn't just a course for medically qualified people. It has been so far, but there's no reason at all why clinical officers shouldn't undergo this course. The objectives are to learn how to assess signs and symptoms of common surgical emergencies and how to initiate an immediate management plan based upon sound principles of clinical practice. That's what we want the guys to go home with at the end. Why undertake assessment? Well, I've explained one reason to account for the money. It's part of the learning process. It ensures a set standard is achieved. And this is important when you're benchmarking courses. In other words, a standard must be the same each course you do. If you buy a bottle of beer, you want it to taste exactly the same as the previous bottle of beer you got, assuming it was the same brand. Um, indicates whether any part of the course is deficient or not required. And I'll explain about that in one second. It motivates trainees and it measures effectiveness of training. It's a two-way thing, this, really. You've got the trainees who need to learn and the trainers who need to train. Uh, I won't go through this in detail. We look at a logbook three months prior to the course. They do pre-course MCQs to assess their current knowledge and skills. We do a formative assessment during the whole of the course. Post-course MCQs to assess acquisition of knowledge and skills. A summative assessment at the end. And then six month post course, we look at their logbooks again, or samples of their logbooks to assess retention of knowledge and skills, and their impact upon their practice. Time does not allow me to, uh, and modesty too, uh, to tell you what they say, but I, I will divulge that they are usually very, very, very pleased with the, the courses and how it's impacted upon their surgical practice. But we also, we also get a report from their trainer in the hospital where they're working. So it's not just purely subjective on the trainee's part. We, we get the guys who are actually with them day in, day out to make sure that uh, what they say is correct. The formative assessment, the global rating scales, the only thing to, to look at, oh, sorry, the only thing to look at is the right-hand column, the unsatisfactory column, uh, and not very many trainees fit into this category, fortunately. Some may do for the first day or so. And at the end of each day, all the trainers and the faculty sit down and go through all the reports from all the modules. And usually, you can pick up somebody on the first or second day, and if they're borderline, then they get proper tuition and feedback. People sit down with them, and by the next day or two, they've gone into two or three. They're either satisfactory or good. 
the post-course and pre-course MCQs, this is what you like to see, the pre-course of the blue, um, that they've actually acquired knowledge and skills to during the time. If those lines at the top there are close together, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the trainee's fault. It could well just as be the trainer's fault. In other words, bad training. Now, this is important talking about feedback. The pilot course that we did three years ago, uh, the urologists were a bit surprised that um, there wasn't such a good feedback as it expected with this renal colic and urosepsis. Yeah, okay. um, and the reason was because south of the Sahara, you don't see that much. So that was taken out of the module and replaced by bladder injury, which is something you do see a lot of, and the answer is there. Uh, this is just a, so the six-month post-course example. I've nearly finished now. Uh, it shows that really, for critical care, general surgery, orthopedic trauma, neurology, most people were, found them useful or very useful. Obstetrics at the bottom, we looked into that, and that was because most of the guys weren't actually doing obstetrics at the time. But we still keep that in as part of the course. So what I would say to you is that the management of surgical emergencies course after rigorous assessment is fit for purpose. Thank you.